Yeah, not so bad, mate. Good. Well, we've been, I've just had a bit of trouble with my printer, just didn't want to stop. So, traditional first question. What do you do? Yeah. Um, well, I'm an engineer by trade, so I started being a self-employed engineer when I came out of my apprenticeship, which was many years ago now, um, when I was 21. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's quite, been quite a while. But that was to do multi-car parking systems, really. Uh, which are all about London. So for parking um, cars in uh, tight spaces and double empty car parking, that sort of thing. Well, that sounds really interesting because it's... Did you know then that that would be in even more demand than it now than it was then? Um, no, I didn't, actually, because it was, a, it was a, a young company at the time and I'd just come out of my apprenticeship and... Um, They'd just taken a franchise over for the units in the UK from an Italian company. And um, it just went from there, really. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, but now it's mostly uh, they're German machines. The Italian market has sort of pretty much gone out of it. There is another company still around. And you've got the Chinese coming into the market now. But um, no, I didn't expect to be in the job for as long as I have been. <laughs> Because when you say car parking, it's not it's not like you just think, oh yeah, you know, you just go to this like people would just assume with car parking, it's just a wide open space with a barrier. It's no, 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 no. When, when, when I what you do. Yeah. when I say car parking, it's uh, their machines for doubling, quadrupling, anything from two cars in one space to six hundred cars underground, and they're you know, you have a, a, a fob reader, you just park into the garage and it takes your car away, parks it, and when you want it back, you don't see the car, it just goes underground, puts it in a bay, and when you want the car back, you just put your fob on the reader and it brings the car back, turns it around, and you drive out. That's amazing. <laughs> so when, you know, this is the point, it's like, you sort of go like, it's to do with car parking, and you go like, yeah, but it's not really the car parking that we just assume. It's no, far no. Complex. When did, when did it get that complicated? Because it couldn't have been like that when you started off, surely. No, no. When I first started off, there was it was just a simple hydraulic machine, almost like a car ramp, really, uh, which ran off a two volt, two forty volt supply. And we built them up, and they were mostly going into uh, people's garages because you only needed nine foot six headroom, or car dealerships, that sort of thing. Uh, and then they become more complicated. Then you had ones that go into pits, so you don't need to move the bottom car to get it out. And then they went on to semi-automatics, where it moves it around. You know, like the jigsaw puzzles, where you, you're trying to get the picture and you, you've only got one space to move into. They're a bit like that. So uh, they're not as complicated as the automatic systems. The automatic systems are huge with electronics, cables and that running everywhere, loads of safety devices. So they're more complicated. Um, but they're probably more prevalent now than they used to be. Mm. The, the simple machines are not so popular nowadays. It's, it's just these things are going into bigger buildings. Although it has had a bit of a downturn because... Uh, you know, the the bigger cities, they've fallen out of love with the car, really, haven't they? Yes. So, so the, you, you don't get so many, uh, you don't get so many grants to do it before you used to have to have so many parking spaces per building. And that was the, that was the law. But they've sort of done away with that. So you don't have to provide the parking spaces for the amount of flats. All right. I didn't realise that. Oh, yeah. so I don't London, so I wouldn't. wouldn't no, no. We, why would you? It's not your game. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. But I'm quite, yeah. I'm quite intrigued by this sort of stuff because a lot of things sort of change in, in ways that you don't anticipate because, as you say, because a lot of big cities don't like the car anymore. 
um, and it and it's and it's sort of difficult. It, they make the car difficult, don't they? It's yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Right? But then you don't see what the repercussions of that are in about design within a city, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, because the problem is, uh, you know, I can remember, I, and I hate driving in London so much so that I haven't driven in there for, for years. Yeah, I don't have a choice. <laughs> no, no, I know you don't have a choice. But I used to go up, well, it shows you how long ago, when I used to go up to see, when I was working with Geoffrey Moore, I used to drive into London quite a bit. And of course, I had to sort of drive around Eaton Square and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but of course, you could get to a certain point and it was just just a gridlock. Yeah. And you, it and you thought, well, <laughs> you couldn't quite work out how, the, how it was going to sort itself out because you're just in this, you know. Yeah, nothing's going like, about. Yeah. Exactly. And you think, well, someone somewhere is blocking this. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? It's not, there wasn't a sort of a flow of traffic at all. I don't know. What, what's it like driving in London now? Is it is there a flow? Because no, no, you've got, you've got <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got cycle lanes now. Yeah, obviously, which, yeah well, of course. Which obviously just... take up the whole road space anyway. So yeah. you've got less space. All the uh, bus lanes now are. 24 hours, so you can't use them now, even off peak. So there's nothing in the bus lane. You still can't use it. So most of my journeys into town now, it, it's 27 miles. So for instance, this week I've been travelling 27 miles for one particular place, which is funny enough an automatic at uh, Grosvenor. And um, it takes me two to two and a half hours to do 27 miles. And that's both ways. So, that's amazing. Yeah. That is that's yeah. the worst, that's the worst part of the job nowadays, really, the traveling. Yeah. And you just got to switch off and chill out, really. Yes. Uh, listen, listen to the radio. So you listen don't worry to it. about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So with engineering then, because you're 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 really good with stuff like this, I know. Um, right. when did you really get when was when did you know that you were going to be involved in doing stuff like engineering? Was it that you were making things and fixing things when you you were younger? Yeah, um, when I was at school, I I took the engineering and metalwork classes, and I finished the courses before anybody else. Um, so it sort of basically in life, you tend to take do the job that you're good at. Not yes. that it's your dream job and you want to be a rock star no. and all that sort of stuff. No, exactly. You are absolutely yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. So so you happen to be good at something. What do you want to go into? I don't know. I'll do that. I happen to be good at that. So that's what I did. I went in, I did an apprenticeship, went through my apprenticeship and, and completed that, uh, come out with flying colours in that. So it was just – and I've always been fairly practical. When I was a kid, I used to make uh, sort of – trains that would fly along the washing line you know <laughs> well this is this is what i mean because again this is what comes up again and again in this podcast how early and not in every single case but generally speaking there's it very early on it's obvious that somebody is very good at a particular thing they show an aptitude to something whether that's yeah, practical skills or yeah, whatever really or, yeah, or they're playing, you know, they're interested in playing drums on pots and pans when they're four. You know, it's that type of thing. Or they're, yeah. they're acting and, and doing dance routines more or less as soon as they can walk and talk. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, which is interesting, isn't it? It is. That yeah. it's that early on. Yeah. yeah. That it's that. Um, and obviously I've known you for quite a few years and you've always seen that sort of stuff is just sort of obvious to you. Um, you, you know what I mean? It's yes. Like, <laughs> I'm, it is I'm, obvious I'm, to you, yeah, because you've, you've said things, well, you know. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see myself as having uh, a particular skill that uh, I, I define as being, I'm really, really good at that, but I've never been frightened to have a go at anything practical. Yeah, but... 
I always say that's true with music, right? When people are good at music, they just have a go at it. And it's not that they necessarily think they're actually particularly good at it. Obviously, they are. Yeah. But they, they don't see it as being difficult to do. No, if no. So some, some things just become... I mean, I can, I can see a problem and I can take most things apart and put them together anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I don't find that, that particularly hard to do because that's how my brain works. Yeah. But I could give it to someone else. And it's like the, um, my, the, the, the younger guy that I've taken on and I'm tr- sort of training up now. Well, one of the things he said to me was that I was expecting him to know certain stuff and, and, and he didn't. And I thought, well, that's just basic. But what he did point out to me, because he's much younger than me, and he went, yeah, but you were taught that stuff at school. I wasn't. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so this is really good. This is really fascinating because there's a lot of things, as you say, you would have seen people do. Yeah. Um, it, and, and, and a lot of things you would have seen your own father do or uncle or whatever, you know, when it was... Oh, coming. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, that is not something that's that common now because, obviously, things like even like cars, unless you've got an old car, they're so bloody complicated that you, you, you need all the gubbins to to be able to, you know, read the computer oh, and stuff. Right? Yeah. So, so, you know, all of that has been taken away from people in what normally would happen. And then, of course, as you said, at school, there was woodwork, there was metalwork, there was cookery. There's all those sort of basic skills that you had a practical knowledge of the thing before you went and studied it any further. Yeah. But, but they're this, this, this two... Oh. Schools nowadays, I think this is my own personal opinion, but I think school now schools nowadays are too frightened that you're going to hurt yourself, and they don't let the kids <laughs> play with stuff. So, so when I was at school, we had a foundry, and we used to do our own casting. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, they wouldn't let you play with fire now. No, no, no. I know, I know. Um, yes, health and safety. <laughs> yes. <laughs> where, where, me where, do we start? where do we start yeah because i think the problem with this is you know at the end of the day it always comes down to who's suing somebody right yeah it's this fear of being sued um and you know and i've sat through you can imagine can't you because i've taught at different schools yes. and i have to sit through a health and safety or child protection thing for for each school and you sit there and you think come on most of this is pretty rubbish. Hmm. Um, but, and, of course, they've got to do this because some boffin has turned around and said, well, you know, we've got to do this. And this is the latest guidelines. You know, not to say that these things aren't relevant because they are. But some of these things are so subtle. If you're working with kids, you know certain kids have got problems at home. Um, and but then often not to do with the fact that you've been on a training course. Hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's one of those things that, you know, the more we try to move away from the risk element of stuff, there's always, a, there's always a, an unintended consequence to that. And again, going back to the education thing, you end up with a lot of kids who, who actually haven't got the basic knowledge that they would have had like you're saying when you were at school they had a foundry right? um but that goes for a lot of stuff actually um because this is one of the things that people complain about kids that go to college and they get go to university and they get their degree and they come out and they actually don't know the basics of the thing that they're going to do because no, no, the, the highfalutin theory yeah I mean, I think all kids at school should be given some sort of practical skills, you know, so they could, you know, don't kill themselves later in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, But, uh, I mean, for instance, it's it's not to do with schools, but um, on the specialised projects that we do for the parking, like like the automatic systems, um, we used to have to bring in specialised contractors from Germany who were doing it all the time because most of the machines are German. 
They've refused to build the machines in the UK now because we have too many rules and regulations on the sites. And, and, they that don't... German, and that's coming from the Germans. Yeah. And they right. say that they can't build the machines to the time scale that they do in Germany because their hands are tied on the installations. So they never refused to do it. And we have to, we've had to find our own, you know, build our own teams in the UK. So our times for doing the installations are just so much longer than they are in Germany because we have to follow all the health and safety cycles. I'm not saying they're a bad thing, but some no. of them just tie you in knots. Yeah. Yes. And, and some of them, you end up with this sort of, um, well, like a Gordian knot that you can't really... If you do this, then that's a problem, you know, and this happens like, I mean, technically speaking, you could look at, well, guitar exams are a really good example of this, right? Yeah. Pat testing. I, I just put guitar that out exams. there. You know, you know where I'm going with this? Yes, yes. Because it's like, well, you walk into a place and you've got an amp. Unless it's a new amp. It needs to be pat tested, technically speaking, and everything that's yeah. in that, that's connected to that amp should be pat tested. So if somebody comes in and they bring their own lead with them, that should technically be pat tested as well. Yeah, yes, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely no way that you could do anything. No, right? um, which makes it completely farcical. Yeah, yeah, doesn't it? You know, anyway. I mean, pack, pack testing was uh, at one point was going all out of control. I, I don't see it so much nowadays. You do still see it, but at one point, every even the hand dryer, which is not, I mean, pack testing, portable appliance tester, that gives you a clue to what pack testing means. But a hand dryer bolted to the wall that's got to be pack tested, you can hardly walk around with it, can you? <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's bizarre. So, obviously, this engineering skill that you've got, right? Yeah. There's a load of items on the wall behind you. Um, yeah. which, are, which is, you know, we're going to get on to, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, what came first, the making the guitar or, or playing the guitar? Playing the guitar. It, yes, it did come first, playing the guitar. I got to a certain age. Uh, and, I, and I thought, hang on a minute, I've got to know more than three chords here. <laughs> so, you know, I now know four. <laughs> but, yeah. um, and that's when I met you, obviously, because uh, I thought, well, I'd like to do something. Uh, now I've not got more time on my hands, but um, I'd had, I'd had a, an old echo guitar for, oh, since I was about 15. And it would sit in the corner, then I'd pick it up didn't really spend any time with it. And I thought, no, because I've always been into music. Um, uh, and most of the best things in life have happened to me through music, meet the wife and all that sort of stuff. It's all been through music. So I thought, well, okay, I'll, um, I'll, I'll get someone to teach me, <laughs> which was obviously you. <laughs> um, so that's going back a while now, isn't it? It is going back a while. I can't remember how long, but we'll just we'll just I can, yeah, I can roughly say okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was a while, yeah. Yeah, it's a while, yeah. What's interesting about music, because you're quite intuitive about things, you've got a good ear, right? And you you've got a, a good sort of feel to what you do. Right. Which is not like your engineering stuff, is it? No. Um, it, no, it's not. It's not, all, no. not. It's, it's very <laughs> instinctive, and um, you get you know you sort of yeah. I, I put you down as a sort of a, a groove player, right? Yep. You're yeah, I'd at, agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So you, you're very good at being able to do something that you've got that you play, and you you, you can fit into a groove, and and it's got a feeling, and and it just has a it just has a sort of it just knows where it's going, right? Yeah. And that's actually quite unusual. You used to get that a lot if you went back in to, well, really, it's, it's our sort of, you know, 
our sort of contemporaries um, early days because of people working things out by ear you get a lot yeah. of play um, but you don't see it so much now I don't think I, I don't okay. see it so much with people no um, um, yeah you're probably right um, so what I find intriguing is that you've got this other aspect of yourself which is not like the very analytical it's obvious if this goes there and this does this you yes. sort of it. yeah uh, it's very it's sort of different now when you started playing well when you started um as you said learning the extra chord yes the, the three chords <laughs> to the four chords uh, <laughs> And the whole world opened up to you yeah. um, in that moment. Did you, because there's certain things that I know, and this, this again is contrary to what you do with engineering. There are certain things within guitar playing that are mechanical, obvious things that make shapes move around. Yeah. Um, and for that, you have to have certain things that are a set of rules, basically. Now, you're obviously very good with the set of rules for engineering. Yes. But you're not, you're not so good with the rules for the guitar. Oh, no, no, I'm terrible. You, exactly. So that's quite, I, I find that quite interesting. Um, because although you, you, you can get around and you know, you know what it sounds like and you know that actually this piece of music is actually in this so you've got a good ear from that point of view yeah um and, and i think that's interesting because it's sort of against it's it's not the same as what you i see with you when you're you're doing with things as an engineer if you see what i mean no you're, you're right and 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 i think that's i think i could but the, the thing is for me I've got so many projects that I'm doing anyway. It's another project. Yes, I no, I get that. To... No, I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying yeah. I'm quite intrigued that it is, it, it's, it's an element of, of you that's different from what you see in your working situation. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which is quite, I, th I, th I, just, I just think that's interesting. So, right. so you got your playing guitar, and then what happens? Because obviously I think, a lot of this must be to do with the fact that you're left-handed. It is, that yeah. You probably went, I need, an, I need a guitar, <laughs> and it might be easier for me to build one as I'm left-handed. Well, I mean, yes, I, I was looking around at guitars, and I'm a, I am a little bit obsessive about sound. So if it doesn't sound right... <laughs> yes, yeah, you are, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't sound right, I get quite annoyed. Um, and I, if it, and that's in my character as well. So, if I've got a good sound going on, like the amp, and I've got it set just right, and every, everything's sounding right, I play better. If it yes. sounds rubbish, I play rubbish. Yes. So I think that's, I think that's true, just generally, anyway. Okay. Right. So um, when I was looking around for guitars, you couldn't go into a shop or very rarely go into a shop and pick up a left-handed guitar unless it was a cheap thing that played awfully. Um, and so I just started playing around with guitars that way, really. So, so for instance, if you wanted, I mean, there's many more available now uh, as left-handed guitars, like for Martin and the PRSs. But in, in, um, when I'm going back, there just wasn't that many around, really. Right. And I've always been fairly practical, so I just thought I'd have a go <laughs> as going back to my nature. You know, I've never been frightened to have a go at something. And my dad was a chippy, so I saw him doing woodworking skills and that. And um, so, so the first one I built was just a cigar box guitar, really. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I moved on to a more fancy, which didn't have a cigar box, and a fancy guitar, cigar box guitar. And then I thought, well, I'll have a go at building an acoustic. I mean, we're, we're talking about quite crude woodworking skills right now. I really didn't know what I was doing. 
Uh, I got got myself a set of plans by Andy Manson. No, Andy Manson who built the mermaid guitar. So he was uh, there was a set of plans flying around for those. So I bought a set of plans for that, and I just just started. I you know, read a couple of books and just had a go. Really, there's no no training in it. It was just I was just using my practical skills. Um, and we're going back to oh. 2009 when I started uh, no 2008 I started building guitars so and it just just went from there really yeah it was interesting because obviously I've seen this sort of develop over time so of course you you, you make these amazing resonator guitars yeah so where what was the thing that made you focus on that was it because um because they are uh, different aren't they? I mean, are, just, yeah. I've always I've always liked the bluegrass music and I've always fancied having a go at slide. Um I could be better at slide, but uh some people find it really difficult. I think i I could get better at playing the slide. Um so it's it was that bluegrass music going on and I I I'd looked at the resonator and, and I'd bought a, uh, a resonator and for me they were a bit one trick pony so normally the resonator you bought was that's because that's the only guitar you didn't have you didn't want to do anything else on it apart from that type of music yeah and when i looked inside it i thought this is atrociously built <laughs> because because you can't see in it they didn't take any care in the insides and stuff and i thought why is nobody doing that they should it should be built like a along the same sort of care and lines as an acoustic just because yeah. you can't see inside so uh, so that's why I started building the resonators. And then that's when that came back to the um, the, the love of music and being into uh, hi-fi and all that sort of stuff. I thought, well, why is everybody covering up the cone with a faceplate and not allowing the sound to get out? So I designed it. I didn't, you know, I just didn't reinvent the wheel. I just designed it with the mind that, well, this should be a speaker because... Okay. The cone is the speaker. You're just hiding the sound if you just try and cover it up with a cover plate. And that's where the whole thing came from. And I didn't use a sound well. I redesigned it, again, using the engineering. I thought I could make it stronger, but with less, less components, which is what I did, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because they're fabulous-looking bits of kit. This. Yeah, they, they've, as I say, the, uh, the early ones... I'm never ever happy with a guitar I build. There's always something I think I could have maybe have done that a bit better. I mean, the customers are happy with it, but they've been slowly getting better and better over the years. Um, uh, and I've made, I don't make loads of them, probably make about two a year. And that's, that's about it, really. Um, I, as I say, the work pressures get on top of it. And I, and I quite like that. I, I'm not under pressure. To yeah. I, I like to build it. I build them because I like building them. I don't build them because it's something I have to do. It's just something I like doing. It's a relax for me. Mm. Uh, maybe mm. that's why it uh, why they sound different. Maybe because you put a bit yeah. more effort into it. Well, I think so because I, I, I definitely think there is. Again, I, you know, I could draw a comparison with that and and writing songs and doing an album or whatever because you like doing it yes instead yeah. of having to do it i mean you can imagine that just changes everything doesn't it it changes the pieces of music in the recording because you're not trying to sell it particularly yeah uh, be nice to sell it but you you don't need to sell x amount which is a bit like what you're saying you know if you build if you build a, a guitar and you're building two a year, and you can and you can sell them, that's different from yeah. trying to build twenty and having no, to sell. Them. You know what I mean? It has, yeah, I mean it has it has been mentioned to me that why don't I get the Chinese to make them? Just keep the design different, but because or, or Taiwanese or something like that. <clears throat> but then. And, and I could sell them for cheaper, but then it's not made by me. It's not my guitar. No. So it, I don't. I wouldn't want to do that anyway. No. It's it's pointless for me. 
No, no, I get that. I totally mm. get that. Totally get that. Because again, it's that, you know, in the end, why would you do that? Because it, it, no, no, because like, it's 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 no, your baby, isn't it? It's, it's like it's Russ for someone giving it away, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah, I mean, do, you know, I don't know if you've ever read the you know, the story of. I mean, it's just sort of just like a sort of apocryphal story of this guy who's a businessman and he's on holiday in Greece and he goes down by the harbour and there's some Greek fisherman, you know, sort of sitting up by his boat and he says, "Oh, he said." Um, Got a day, you day off today? He said, No, he said, I've, I've been out, caught some fish. And, you know. I went, really? He said, You're not going out again? No. He said, You know, you, you could. He said, Well, I don't need to. And, his, and then he just got, it goes into this idea that, but you yeah. know, what you could do is you could hire people to go out, get some more boats, and, and you know, go out and do this and whatever. And then you could build the fleet up and everything. And he said, yeah, but why would I do that? Because it's yeah. this sort of one mentality, isn't it? Of like, why? why yeah, why yeah. Ty I mean, build, you know, well, why? Yeah, why? I mean, also, also the the resonator question: Why a resonator? Well, I, as I said, I like the sound, but also there's not that many people making good ones. No. Um, there's, it's like I can make electrics, and I've made electrics. Yeah, but I can't I, compete with the likes of Fender and Gibson, and <laughs> I just can't. You know, I, for, they're they're bashing them out in such large numbers, and uh, I just I just can't compete with that really. So it was easier for me to pick on something as a niche market. I could do well, and I could sell the odd one or two along the way, really. And, and that's why and, and I quite like the design as well that we come up with. That's been uh, copyrighted, so nobody can copy that um, as, a, as a guitar. But the electrics, has, I mean, you've got one of my electrics from, yeah. from years ago. Yeah. Um, oh, as a, as, as a sideline, because I, I started building, uh, building the guitars in 2008. Right? That's when I very first, from this first. In 2009, Peter Green bought one of my ex guitars. So that was yeah. only a year, and I've already got Peter yeah. Green on board. And if you wanted to buy it, it's up at Bottoms Auction this month. Is it? <laughs> yes. Because oh, okay. they contacted me about, you know, what was it made of, you know, and all this sort of stuff. What was the pickup? So all the descriptions in there. So, yes, it's actually on Bottoms Auction this month. Page 30. <laughs> right. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. So yeah. what's the pick? Was Peter Green the first one that, the first big yeah. one? That yeah, so Pete, Peter Green was 2009. He was my first customer, um, or famous customer, let's put it that way. And then in 2011, Mark Knopfler was the second famous customer. And then we went on to uh, Ray Majors, who you met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then in 2016, um, Kaleo contacted me and wanted me to build the guitars for JJ in that band. He's now, he's on his fourth. I've got to build him a, a fourth one now. Right. Okay. So these, they're not Icelandic? They are, yeah. 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 I like the guys. They're a really good band. So, so you see, this is what I, I quite like how it's sort of very organic the way that everything sort of has sort of developed with what you've done and and how who who it is who's buying the stuff yes yeah. you've got some big marketing plan going on um I, I i i still pinch myself now really because it just sort of went from nothing to something all of a sudden yeah. And there's there's many guitar makers out there that are really good and they've got no, they haven't pulled any famous people on board. And I suppose it's just, for me, I just think, well, it's, it's, a lot of it is being at the right place at the right time, really. Oh, my God, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and you know, there's, there's a certain amount of luck in that. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, because I, I, luck is one of those things that you, I, 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 
I've mentioned this to you before, I think, yeah. about, you know, um, we, we don't like to think about luck, but certainly every other culture in every other period of time always considered luck as an important element. Uh, you know, you can sort of think, well, that's just being, you know, making sure that you make the contacts. Yeah, it is, absolutely. But there is that element where, uh, in fact, there's an interesting story. Um, a friend of mine who I actually interviewed a little while ago because he'd um, he, he was a he's a guitar teacher down in Dorset, and um, he thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll do. Let's see what this social media thing is. You know, you know anything. I'll try TikTok. You know, just completely out of the blue. Yeah. Uh, and he said, you know, it started off, and I thought I'll just put a couple of guitar solos up on the, on TikTok. And he said, then. I did one and I got something like 50,000 views in a day, something like that. It was ridiculous. Yeah. And then the next morning, it had just gone nuts. So he, he's the guy who's the old grey guitarist on TikTok, right? So he's now got, I don't know, 100 million and a half, two million followers, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, so I've known, I've known John for quite some number of years and he's just pretty ordinary you know he, he won't mind me saying that he doesn't doesn't look like a rock star you know, so. <laughs> um so he said he said um yeah so a lot of the kids that i teach you know they sort of said you know they get nervous about things and stuff like that and he said well you know don't need to get nervous and they go well it's all right for you he thought and he thought about this and and then he thought well okay i'll, I'll set myself a challenge so what he did was he, he managed to get on to America's Got Talent. Right. <laughs> and he's, and of course, he sends a bit, you know, puts up a video about this, the, the show, and, and it, it just blows the whole thing apart. It's just incredible. And because um, he turned, you know, he just turns up and he looks like a granddad, you know. Yeah. Um, and of course he starts playing. And of course now this has just gone completely viral because not only is he on America's Got Talent he's you know he's been in the Huffington Post he's been on the BBC and everything okay yeah but there was no plan this was the point right but what you've done it's sometimes you know when we go to do something we think we've got to have a plan you know we've got to have a master plan like a great yeah. strategy and often what I've noticed with things like this is there isn't one there isn't one. Well, it certainly wasn't for me, no. It was, I was just building them and then someone would say, oh, I like that, can you make me one? Oh, I like that, can you make me one? <clears throat> and I'd started making like a few and they just went, so I just thought, well, I might as well turn this into a business because sooner or later, you know, a tax man's going to start knocking on the door, you know, you're selling guitars. So that's what I did. I started up the website, Sent the, uh, sent the guitars off to uh, four magazines, guitarist magazines. I got four really good reviews uh, in the magazine, you know, uh, even like, you know, some of the best acoustics you can buy at the moment was coming up and I didn't even know what it was going to do that. And um, nothing, nothing came from the magazines, not a dicky bird. So I thought, well, this is pointless. What? what? Then I did a video with Temperance Movement. They agreed to play the guitars in a, in a video, and they did a couple of three uh, acoustic sets with my guitars on a couple of numbers they did. And then that's it. As soon as it went on YouTube, I uh, started people calling me. I've seen this. and So, yeah, I'm not a great fan of social media, and but you find that you have to be on it to to get yourself noticed because people just don't pick up magazine and read anymore. They're no, the day, on their phones and stuff. Yeah. But again, if you, if you think about it, you know, magazines, you know, the modern magazine is something like. Oh yeah. Saying? I suppose you're online there, aren't they? Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, it is, it, it's really where people get their information now. Hmm. Um, and, and the thing is once something catches people's attention, you know, because your guitars, they are stunning looking. Um, when something grabs you like that, then 
it sort of sells itself because it stands out from everything else, which is interesting. You're talking about the resonators because you're not competing with an awful lot of other things with the resonator, are you? Which is the, no, the, no, I'm not. And 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 also your guitar, those resonator guitars aren't really just resonators because I use mine to sort of play sort of jazz style. Yeah, I know. I've seen you play jazz on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, and they're brilliant. Absolutely brilliant for that because they've got such a great sound. Yeah. Uh, so the point about it is again, you know, if you've got something, it doesn't have to have the big market appeal, does it? That's the thing. It just no. has to have the thing that that makes somebody really like what it is you do. And you, you could draw comparis comparisons to music in that way, couldn't you? So, you know, a, a great band, you listen to lots of music that most people know about. Yeah. But it's exactly the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. When you listen to an album and you think that is a great album and you're listening to it obviously on vinyl with really good gear and all that stuff. And, you, and it's because of that. It's exactly the same thing as one of your guitars has that quality and an appeal to, a, you know, like a little niche. You know, so if you found a blues album by somebody that hardly anybody's heard, you know, yeah. you mentioned to me a, 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 a Muddy Waters album that I hadn't heard of. Right. You know, same thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. I, I try to, I always talk to the customer before I build the guitar to get a, uh, an idea of what they actually want. Um, but the some of the things they suggest can be a bit outrageous <laughs> or won't work. And yes. so I try and steer them away from that. I had a customer, he was used to playing a classical guitar and that's the size Nicky wanted. And, and I just went, well, it would be, it's a resonator, it would be unplayable. It's okay on a classical guitar, you've got nylon strings and stuff, but, you know, we're playing around with 13 gauge strings here and there, and it's going to have a radius, you know, it's, the, the classical guitar has got flat fingerboard. So, but I managed to talk him down from what's the classical guitar? 55 mil, isn't it? I think something like that. The nut. Oh, so yeah, I don't, I, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I talked him down to around about 51 mil, but that meant I had to redesign the headstock because the headstock I would normally do would look like a table tennis racket. So uh, there was a lot of work involved in that. And come to finish, it, I mean, to be fair, it did play okay. But if he had carried on with the size neck that he wanted, I'd have said, sorry, that's not for me. I'm not building it. Because I don't want to build something that's, no. A, you're going to give me a bad reputation and B, doesn't play very well. No, no, no. no. I think that's the thing. Once you understand how something works. Yeah. And again, that's the... You know, that's the mechanics of it, isn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of a lot of guitarists. Well, again, again we're talking about guitars, right? How yeah. often is it that people have got the thing of, you know, oh, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, he had the, the this strat and he was using these strings and he, he was using this amp and it all this. He had given Stevie Ray Vaughan a 12 string guitar and he would sound like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yes. Right? Yes. And it's like, you know, yeah, because it's not really, it's not really about all those things that we try to go, oh yeah, that's that's you know the main components of it. And and I think that's what happens, like you're saying, with a classical player. They know certain things about a classical guitar, but they don't realize that that doesn't necessarily translate that's across right, of to an acoustic, even, you know, because as you say, the nine or strings and all sorts of stuff, right? And the shape of the fretboard, you know. I know you're buffering a bit there, Vic, I think. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know which which one of us, because you've sort of frozen. So I don't know. Hang on, let me see what happens with you. you gonna... Anything happen? No, you're still sort of fairly... You... Speak a minute, Pete, can you? Oh, there we go. Back. Yeah, you stopped. It's been slow motion. 
Yeah, yeah, you actually froze, so I don't quite know which way around that was. Doesn't doesn't matter. But yeah, so just saying that I think sometimes musicians are the worst people to tell you exactly what they need on a guitar. Yeah, but if, if there's one thing I've learned over the years that the, the sound doesn't the the sound of Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimmy Page that comes from the fingers, not, yes. not from the guitar that they're playing. <laughs> That's their style. Yes. And I've said this a lot. I've said this all the time. And again, you know, you know this is going to, be, going to be one of the things the Blues Camp this year is about. When people turn up and they've got their array of pedals, you know, and their amp that does the thing. But, you know, yeah. You know, and they've got to use that. And it's like, well, no, because, you know, in, in a real life situation, you might have to go into that amp. Yeah, that's just the backline amp that you're going to be using. That's it. Yeah. Um, and you know, these are the pedals. You don't need a certain type of distortion pedal or a certain type of whatever. No. That's what you got. Because I think there's so much of this analytical thing, which is very intellectual, that you know, if you do this, then that happens. It's a bit like, well, no, let's just change the way we think, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I did. I did start off having a, a, a fair uh, array of pedals at one point, but slowly and slowly, I got rid of them. Um, and I've, you know, all I've ended up with is a tuner, a wah, and a distortion pedal, and that's about it, really. It's all I needed. Just yeah. a bit of overdrive now and again. Yeah, because you know, like I've said to you, you know, when you're playing a piece of music, the song sort of does itself something which goes back to this idea of like the groove when you're playing yeah when you play something that's got a, a groove to it it's sort of got its own life in it and if you sort of take that if you look at music that way it gets your ego out of the way this is i think the most important thing and you end up playing the piece in the way that the piece seems to direct you yes but that's not how most people think and um and i think it's it's interesting when people discover that side of things that, you know, when you're creating stuff. And, and this, you know, there are certain things that are the mechanics of the thing, you know, whether it's building a guitar or writing a piece of music or whatever, you know, you're using scales and chords and whatever, and they work in a particular way. But then there's this other element that you just, you know, how can I put this? You know, of all the guitars that you've made, even if you made them all the same, there'd be one that's sort of better than the others. Oh, yes. No, they all have a generic sound, but every single one sounds different. I yeah, can't, exactly. It would be impossible for me to make the guitar sound exactly the same exactly. to every single guitar. It'd be, you, you couldn't do it. No. And it, that's, that's the bit I'm getting at. Yeah. So you've got a lot of stuff that you can go, well, here's the mechanics of the thing. And then there's something that is external to that that happens. It's like you could write loads of songs. I could sit down and write 10 songs, one after another, no problem. One of them will be better than the others. Yeah, of course. I mean, will, yeah. by a long shot. And yet you've written them all the same way. Yeah. And I think, well, it's just a case of that's how it is. You just yeah. write and that one's going to be better than another one. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It, uh, I mean, uh, if a guitar sounds a particular way, it will suit a finger picker style of playing because it has that resonance and, you know, and the overhang when you're playing picking as it would do for someone that strums, you know? So they all, yes, you're right. They all sound different. They all sound different in someone else's hands. You know, but they do have a generic sound, and that's that's the best I can do. Yes, yeah, and, and it shouldn't be any other way, really, should it? No, yes. no. Cool stuff. So, what what have you got on the go at the moment, then? Instantly. On the go at the moment, uh, there is another resonator on the bench. <clears throat> that one's going to Australia. Um, and that's uh, Bubinga, uh, Waterford, Waterford Bubinga, with a colour top. Then I've got another one to build for a customer who, uh, funny enough, he's the one with the wider net. Um, 
he's <clears throat> he wants an all-color guitar built, which I built him, and he really likes that. I'm not a great fan of car myself. I think it's vastly overrated and overpriced now. So he has gone for Honduras Rosewood. I think you'll like that. And uh, the next one I've got to do, um, I've got to build another Island guitar for JJ. The one with all the mother of uh, pearl inlays with the Icelandic Guardians and the Iceland in the headstock. Um, he really likes that guitar, which got damaged on the road and, I had, it came back to me for repair. Unfortunately, it's, it was easy enough to repair, which I did. Uh, but he likes the sound of that one so much, he doesn't want to take it on the road anymore. But he still wants the look of that guitar. So I've got to build him one. Uh, it wants a darker colour again. But I've got to build him one which is more roadworthy, robust, that can stay, take the knocks and, and things. So I've got some ideas for that. Um, and it's about choosing a wood that's really stable but still sounds good, so quite plain looking. Uh, I'm going to use Wenge for that, um, but it's it's a nice stable wood, does sound good. It's just boring to look at, but when you're on the stage and you've got all the bling of the gold on the front, the mother of pearl inlays on the guitar, that's really what you're looking at. You're not looking at the, all the intricacies no. of the wood, really, are you? No, of course but, not. No. Only when you're playing it, you actually see it. That's it, yeah. As long as it sounds good and it takes the knocks on the road, that's fine. So that's that's the next one I've got to build. Uh, and I'm still talking to other customers as well about future builds. That You know, you, you have a – it's funny. I, there's, I always seem to have an influx. You have nothing for a while. Mm. And then all of a sudden – you get two or three people come along and say, oh, yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I'd like to place the order. Uh, and I tell everybody uh, it's sort of like 12 to 18 months to build. Unfortunately, I've told everybody that to, uh, this time. <laughs> so I've got to get my finger out and, and build those ones. <clears throat> but that's what's on the bench at the moment. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Awesome. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put some stuff in the show notes now that people can connect with you. Um, I mean, you, you, I love your guitars. I really do. Well, but, thank you. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and they get plenty of use, actually, especially the electric one, because it's, I use it for examining and all sorts of stuff. It's really light, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's got, because it's got that spoilted beach. Spoilted beach top, yeah. Top, yeah, which looks amazing. And, well, um, let's, let's see what the Peter Green one goes for, because it might... <laughs> It might put the value up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then I won't be able to take it out with me. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Yeah, that's good. All right, then, Pete. Well, that that was that was wonderful, mate. It's really good to talk. No, no. Thanks for chatting. And uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, keep keep busy. Yeah, I will do. And I'll see you on the on the next jam, as I expect. Yeah, yeah. The jamming sessions that we do. Awesome yeah. stuff. All right, mate. See you All soon. right. Cheers. <laughs>